It is our pleasure to welcome you to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Columbia, the church nurturing spirit and service. Whatever the faiths you have known or the flags of your heritage, you are welcome here. Whether you arrived by a long or short route, you are welcome here. Good morning. Welcome to the UU Church where very little is necessarily so. As we uh, continue our month exploring truth, I open this morning with words from the poet Rilke. I beg you to have patience with everything unresolved in your heart and try to love the questions themselves as if they were locked rooms or books written in a very foreign language. Don't search for the answers which could not be given to you now because you would not be able to live them. And the point is to live everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps then someday far in the future you will gradually, without even noticing it, live your way into the answer. We gather this day not necessarily to search for an established truth, but to join together on a journey into mystery and understanding intertwined. As we join our hearts in a curious and rich unknowing, may we live ever more deeply this day and always into the questions that shape and form our lives. Our story this morning is a koan, a paradoxical teaching story from the Zen Buddhist tradition, meant in part to help practitioners break through duality. After the koan, I will ring a bell to begin two minutes of silence, and after two minutes, the bell will ring again. Do let me know after the service if you experience enlightenment as a result of this koan. <laughs> I would like to add unlearned, uninformed Zen master to my resume. <laughs> so here it is. A non-Buddhist philosopher came to the Buddha and said, I do not ask for words. I do not ask for non-words. The Buddha just sat in silence. The philosopher said admiringly, the world-honored one with his great mercy has blown away the clouds of my illusion and enabled me to enter the way. And after making bows, he took his leave. Then Ananda asked the Buddha, what did he realize to admire you so much? The world-honored one replied, a fine horse runs even at the shadow of the whip.
You're wrong. You are so wrong. You are always wrong. Famous last words, <laughs> which I uttered to my husband some years ago. Unsurprisingly, I would come to regret them. The dispute was ridiculous, thankfully, though it isn't always so. This particular disagreement was about a movie we were watching. It was the 2006 film, The Prestige, a movie about a pair of stage magicians dueling to perform the most mind-bending illusion and stretching the limits of truth, deception, and possibility itself. The movie's set in late 19th century London, and at one point, one of the, the magicians seeking the aid of technology to perform an illusion that should be impossible goes to visit the reclusive scientist Nikola Tesla at his conservatory on the side of a mountain in Colorado. Tesla appears in his first scene walking through a field of snapping electrical volts like lightning. And James turns to me in the theater and whispers, hey, that's David Bowie. I whispered back, that's not David Bowie. And James said, of course it is. He just walked through a field of lightning. That is so David Bowie. <laughs> At which point I stage whispered those ill-fated words, you are wrong. You are so wrong. You are always wrong. <laughs> well, as you know, we live in the age of the internet, that arbiter of all marital disputes. <laughs> And the moment we left the theater, James pulled out his phone and enters into Google, and there it was in black and white, Nikola Tesla, played by glam rocker David Bowie. <laughs> According to your logic, he said, this must mean I'm always right. <laughs> and so you can see why I have regretted my words ever since. Even now, years later, if we have a disagreement about the facts, all he has to do is look me in the eye and say two words, David Bowie. <laughs> I was wrong. I was so wrong. But I'm not always wrong, am I? Most things I'm right about, or I would change my thinking immediately. I mean, how many of you can think of something, even one thing, which you currently hold to be true, but which you also know to be wrong? <laughs> no one? Look at this room full of people who are right about everything. <laughs> Catherine Schultz, author of Being Wrong, Adventures in the Margin of Error, points out that in the present moment, the moment where we live, being wrong feels exactly like being right, because we generally don't know we're wrong until after the fact, when the error has been exposed. In that way, in this present moment, every single person in this room is certain that they are right about everything, even though surely there are facts about which we might disagree. Schultz uses a great metaphor to describe our experience of being wrong. You know the Roadrunner and the Coyote from Looney Tunes? In every episode, the Coyote is chasing the Roadrunner off another cliff. And the cliff is no problem for the Roadrunner because he can fly. But for the Coyote, the cliff is a problem. He can't fly. And so he runs right off the edge every time, and we know he's doomed. But you may remember from the cartoon he never actually falls off the cliff until he looks down and realizes what he's done. And so in every cartoon, he runs right off the cliff and he just keeps running out over thin air with no ground beneath him. And of course, he's always doomed. We know that's the joke, to look down and then to plummet with a face like... <laughs> but as long as he doesn't realize he's run off the cliff, he just keeps running. We are like this, says Schultz, in our experience of being right and wrong. We can walk right off the cliff of truth and keep walking around in our own self-assurance of rightness. We won't actually plunge to the ground until someone or something else shows us the error of our ways. We were wrong all along, 
But as long as we didn't feel wrong, we could keep on moving, operating exactly as if we were right, which it turns out is how we go around the world operating. We are right. We are so right. We are always right. Except that we're not. Schultz point out, points out that it's a problem to have a world full of people walking around in assurance of their rightness for at least two reasons. One, we don't agree on all the facts. And so in order to preserve our sense of rightness, we end up disregarding, disassembling, and at some point outright demonizing the worldview of those who don't agree with us. And two, when we cling to certainty of our worldviews and their rightness, there is literally nothing for us to learn and nowhere for us to go. In other words, the continual assumption of rightness or certainty is both an ethical and an intellectual problem, and perhaps even a spiritual one. Schultz writes, to err is to wander. And wandering is the way we discover the world and ourselves. Being right might be gratifying, but in the end it is static, a mere statement. Being wrong is hard and humbling and sometimes even dangerous. But in the end, it's a journey and a story. So how many of you enjoy being wrong? <laughs> I don't believe you. How many of you particularly appreciate feeling uncertain or ignorant? All right, but how many of you find deep satisfaction in asking good questions? And how many of you expect that you will probably never find complete answers to that question, but find joy in the search itself? A room of Unitarians. <laughs> and how many of you come to this place week after week to continue on a journey over the cliff of what we know and into the wild flight of all we do not understand? A few Unitarians. <laughs> and so could we not make the link between our errors, our uncertainty, even our ignorance, and our trip full of wandering wonder into the deep and wide unknown. We worship, after all, to stand in awe under a heaven of stars. Before a flower, a leaf in sunlight, or a grain of sand, we worship to be silent, receptive. Our worship is the mystery within us, reaching out to the mystery beyond. It is the inarticulate silence yearning to speak. It is the window of the moment open to the sky of the eternal. Our worship, our work together is uncertain, unsettled, unknown, out of control. Our work together is a rigorous not knowing that speaks and unsays itself. It is words and non-words. It tends toward silence. The feeling of being right, so right, always right, comfortable though it may be, and natural though it may be to our human psyches which seek certainty and control, is not the pathway to our deeper understanding of ultimate truths or of our fellow human beings. In fact, the path of perpetual certainty probably leads in the opposite direction, to willful ignorance and relationships of demonization and domination. We are not here to be right. We are here to grow in understanding and love. We are here to resist a culture of static certainty with a culture instead of complexity that is fluid, curious, humble, that perhaps even tends 
towards silence. And it is our willingness to be uncertain, so deeply uncertain, always intentionally uncertain. It is that willingness that will open our minds to perpetual discovery, our spirits to incomprehensible truths, and our hearts at last to each other. We are here to live the questions, and so doing to journey together into the heart of the unknown. In his theological work, The Vision of God, 15th century mystic Nicholas of Cusa gave us an image for this journey into the unknown. He says we enter a cloud, a mist, darkness, ignorance. Paradoxically, he describes his vision of God as the impossibility of sight. His work points beyond language, beyond reason. It is only deep in the cloud of the impossible, he writes, that we can reach the inaccessible or understand the unknowable. It is only through a learned ignorance the deep awareness of all we do not and cannot know, that we even begin to get a glimpse of the ultimate. You might be thinking, first she tells us we have to be wrong, and then she says we have to be ignorant too. Ignorance is so not Unitarian Universalist, you might be thinking. But there is a distinction here between what contemporary process theologian Catherine Keller calls a willful ignorance and a mindful one. Willful ignorance, she says, is an ignorance oblivious to itself, and it often characterizes authoritative knowledge. It will emerge as the opposite of the learned ignorance, the learning that knows its own ignorance and therefore does not cease to learn We may call it, not without a Buddhist echo, the mindful unknowing. Willful ignorance, Keller writes, serves to obfuscate or mystify on behalf of some desired absolute. Willful ignorance holds facts to be true in spite of proof to the contrary. It ignores all it does not know. Mindful ignorance, on the other hand, minds all it does not know. It drives further learning rather than halting learning with some certain claim to truth. Mindful ignorance leads us straight into the mystery, into the luminous darkness, the incomprehensible place beyond reason where the deepest truth abides. Kusa says, I must enter into the cloud and admit the coincidence of opposites, above all capacity of reason, and seek there the truth where impossibility confronts me. Above reason, above even every highest intellectual ascent, at that place which every intellect judges to be the most removed from truth, there is God. Except for the God part, it sounds kind of Buddhist to me. His writing is like a giant koan just beyond the grasp of the rational mind. At the coincidence of opposites, where words and no words meet, I imagine there the Buddha sits in silence, or the mystic sits in ecstasy, pointing us toward non-dual experience, a third way, an infinite opening beyond the categorizing inadequacy of the reasoning mind. There, Kusa would say, is God. There is enlightenment. There is ultimate understanding, peace, union, wholeness, and it takes our ignorance to get us there. Neuroscientist Stuart Firestein 
says that this is actually an insight that resonates with the heart of science. In his book, Ignorance, How It Drives Science, Firestein names the intellectual power of ignorance as the driving force in the human quest for understanding. He writes, there are a lot of facts to be known in order to be a professional anything, lawyer, doctor, engineer, accountant, teacher. But with science, there is one important difference. The facts serve mainly to access ignorance. Scientists don't concentrate on what they know, which is considerable but minuscule. They concentrate on what they don't know. Science, he says, traffics in ignorance, cultivates it, and is driven by it. Mucking about in the unknown is the adventure of science. In this way, he argues, true intellectual discovery comes not from building upon what we think we know, but from journeying to the very edge of our knowledge and then casting out into the almost infinite unknown. Science produces ignorance, he says, and ignorance defines science. And what he means is science shows us all we do not know. And ignorance gives science its edges, its questions, its insatiable taste for discovery. Therefore, it is not our successes that drive intellectual pursuit, not our static rightness, but our failures, our wrongness, our ongoing journey into the uncertain. Or as physicist Marcelo Gleiser writes, we strive toward knowledge, always more knowledge, but must understand that we are and will remain surrounded by mystery. It is the flirting with this mystery, the urge to go beyond the boundaries of the known that feeds our creative impulse and makes us want to know more. He continues, this realization should open doors, not close them, since it makes the search for knowledge an open-ended pursuit, an endless romance with the unknown. A mindful ignorance, the cloud of the impossible, a culture of complexity that is fluid, curious, and humble, an endless romance with the unknown. I believe that is what we seek when we set out upon a search for truth and meaning. So how do we cultivate in ourselves and in our community that capacity for uncertainty, that cloud culture, that love affair with the unknown? It will probably mean questioning ourselves every time we feel too assuredly right, and examining even our most closely held truths with philosophical rigor. It will certainly mean practicing wonder often and intentionally enough for the unknown to become a beautiful mystery rather than a frightening specter. It will mean loosening our grip on certainty and control through regular spiritual practice. It will mean putting our ideas in truly open dialogue with opposing viewpoints in places like this. It will mean believing in our own worth, enough to be wrong about things without feeling as though that makes us broken or inherently wrong at our core. It will mean rooting our actions in careful and ongoing discernment and being flexible and ready to change course when we find ourselves wandering down the wrong path. It will mean asking another question every time we think we've reached an answer. It will mean finding the courage to sit in paradox in faith that the coincidence of opposites will pull us not apart from ourselves, but into deeper experience of the impossible and the true. It will mean telling stories and speaking metaphors 
and using poetry to break through the duality of language. It will tend on and on towards silence, deeper than words, wider than no words, and ever more profound. This community speaks a lot, and it is also a place where we hold silence. It is so rare to find that in this world. We want to support that whenever we can and wherever we can. And I hope that you would like to support that here. In the spirit of courageous love, we forge a community of radical welcome and deep connection that moves us together to heal the world. You are welcome to share our broadcast of our worship. To find out more, go to uuchurch.net, and we look forward to seeing you next Sunday. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday. We look forward to seeing you next Sunday. You are welcome here.